Thank you for joining us tonight for our Michigan Beekeeper Q&A webinar here at the end of September. Uh, we're going to have a whole bunch of questions that have been submitted tonight, so we're, we look forward to chatting about all of these things with you. But first, we're going to do a few introductions uh, before we get started. And I'd like to introduce you to our MSU Apiculture team. We've been working together to put these webinars on uh, over the course of 2020. Uh, Dr. Megan Milbrath, she is an associate professor in the Department of Entomology and a beekeeper in Jackson County. We have Anna Heck, who is an extension educator. She works primarily in policy and beekeeping education, and she is also a beekeeper with a business in Ingham County. Dan Wines, who's our Bee Informed Partnership Tech Transfer uh, representative here at MSU. He works with commercial beekeepers all across the United States and also runs a beekeeping operation in Ingham County. Myself, uh, Adam and Grayo, I'm the Veterans Liaison for MSU Extension and run the Heroes to Hives program. And I'm based in Luce County in the UP and I also uh, run a beekeeping business up there. And then uh, Dr. Zachary Wang, who's a professor in the Department of Entomology, primarily working in uh, honeybee biology as well. And Zachary's not with us tonight, but the other four of us are here with you this evening. We've been getting a, a whole bunch of questions and we get these all the time from beekeepers across the state and across the country about your beekeeping uh, issues and, and questions that you have. And we've been really directing uh, everybody we can to the ask an expert function, which is at extension.org. This, um, this tool allows you to submit questions to us as a team, and then we're able to distribute those questions across the team so that we can make sure that we can get those questions answered for you. It's also got some tracking mechanisms for us so that your questions don't get lost in the hundreds of emails that we get a day uh, from other beekeepers. So really great way to get your questions uh, answered by experts. And it's not just um, beekeeping, that you can pretty much ask just about anything uh, that comes around tonight uh, or in your uh, farming endeavors um, on ask an, uh, ask an Expert as well. So ask.extension.org backslash ask is where you can get that uh, tool. We've been doing a whole bunch of webinars this year and we've got a lot of resources and previous webinars, um, all of the resources that we talk about tonight in the webinar um, are all going to be located at our MSU Apiculture webinar uh, website. And you can see that web address right there, uh, pollinators.msu. We also will have upcoming webinars listed there as well. So this is really uh, your kind of one-stop shop for all of your resources related to beekeeping from MSU. And if you go to our website at pollinators.msu.edu, it's the beekeepers tab there that you see marked in the red arrow. And then for the webinar function, uh, you can see those resources on the right side there will pop up and you can see webinars there below. But this is where you're gonna find all sorts of resources related to many of the questions that you have submitted tonight. Uh, one thing that I do wanna mention is that the webinar tonight uh, those of you that have registered for this webinar, um, you were given the option to submit questions ahead of time. We are also broadcasting this on Facebook Live. Those of you that are watching this on Facebook Live, we are not monitoring the questions that you're posting in the, in the um, chat or the uh, comments area of Facebook. So just know that the questions that we're going to be addressing tonight were submitted ahead of time. We also have several Facebook pages that we maintain with all sorts of great resources and as far as events and things that we're doing around MSU. We've got our MSU beekeeping a Facebook page, that's at MSU Honeybees. We've got our Heroes to Hives page, which is our beekeeping education program for military veterans and their dependents, that's at Heroes to Hives. And then MSU's Michigan Pollinator Initiative, which kind of is the umbrella for all things pollinator related at MSU, that's at Michigan Pollinator Initiative. And then finally, another program that we have that we wanted to highlight tonight for you to be aware of is our Pollinator Champions course. Our Pollinator Champions course is really a fantastic opportunity for you to learn more about the wonderful world of pollinators at large, not just honeybees, but all those amazing native species that we have here in Michigan. And Pollinator Champions is a great way to understand those organisms and to also just how to support them. You can register for Pollinator Champions. It's a free course that you can take. What a great thing to be doing this time of the year as things are slowing down. And um, if you want to, for a small fee, you can also become a certified Pollinator Champion. So you can go around and train everybody else about the great things happening, happening in the world of pollinators. 
Great, thanks Adam for the introduction. So I'm going to just share real quickly a few of our opportunities coming up for online education. One is through the Michigan Beekeepers Association. So that's our statewide beekeeping organization and they are doing a virtual fall conference. It will be held Saturday, October 17th and 18th. It is free to members, but you do have to be a member of the MBA in order to attend. And they've done a really awesome job with a, lining up a lot of different speakers uh, and you should be able to hear a wide range of topics. So even if you don't get your question answered tonight, you might find that there's a whole session on your, on your question at that conference. All right, another upcoming opportunity is that the USDA is hosting a virtual field day. And for this field day, you don't register ahead of time, you just click on the link for the Zoom webinar when it, uh, at the right time. So that's October 10th at 10 a.m. Eastern. And so we have all of the links and registration information for these upcoming opportunities on our pollinators website, with, on our web, webinar website. Another opportunity for online education is COLOS. Is, they're doing an e-conference and that will be hold, held October 12th and 13th. You can register for the conference or you can participate in their free day uh, by joining their Facebook page and watching their Facebook Live on Monday, October 12th. And you can comment on their Facebook page on that live stream and they'll engage with participants there. And finally, the American Honey Producers Association is also organizing an online conference. So that will be held December 3rd and December 4th. It's $50. And this is a national organization that is hosting it. All right, so there's several things that we're doing for our bees right now. Um, we're going to hit on these topics tonight. So one is removing honey and reducing hive space. One is feeding. One is hive wrapping and um, preventing moisture. One is queen issues, combining colonies, equipment storage, grow control, planting, and other questions as well. So this time of year is one of the times of year that we get probably the most questions because a lot of people are really worried about wintering loss and many beekeepers think that fall or late summer is the most important time for getting their bees ready to winter. And one of the messages that we wanted to put up front is that, you know, now we're kind of tidying up all season long. We're working to get our bees ready for winter but by now they should pretty much be where they want them to be. Um, so if you're not, we'll help deal with some of the questions and the weird issues that you're dealing with, but we really wanted to get that mentality out there that you know, you're setting your bees up all summer long for success, and then right now they should really be set. And in all honesty, the fall is a very low labor time of year um, for us as beekeepers in Michigan. And when we say that we set them up to where we want to be, we're going to, um, we're really wanting to have a amount. So here we have two deeps that are like the colony that's going to overwinter and we'll have our honey removed already at this point. But we want to have a nice condensed colony that is a nice, big, strong, healthy cluster of bees with a nice, good queen in it that's really, really healthy with a um, smaller hive volume and lots of food. And now we're going to like talk about all of the specifics for that. So the, the first of these kind of topics in the, in the realm of colony configuration, um, you know, colony size. Um, so I'll read the question we have here. It's a lot of, a lot of text, a lot of numbers. Um, I keep eight frame medium hives. Three weeks ago, one hive was four boxes high and all boxes were filled with nectar. There was two frames of brood in the bottom box. I added a box of empty drawn comb above it. Now at the end of September, I have a hive filled with nectar, but for a brood chamber that runs two frames wide and five boxes high, who does that? Do I condense this colony for winter? If so, how? So 
Good question. It took me a minute. The first thing I wanted to do was kind of visualize this colony. Um, and I, I myself keep uh, my brood chambers in 10 frame deep equipment. Um, so thinking about actually what does this hive look like? It currently exists in eight frame equipment, five boxes that are all mediums. And so converting, that's the equivalent to about two and a half 10 frame deeps. Um, which is a totally reasonable configuration going into winter. When I first read this, I was envisioning this big kind of unwieldy tower, and it's not that at all. It's, it's a very reasonable sized colony going into the winter. So what this question is describing is we have brewed through a couple frames all the way up through the colony, uh, through each of those boxes. Um, should it be rearranged? Um, my, my thought is at this time of year, particularly um, end of September, you know, we're in October tomorrow, I don't want to do any manipulation of the brood nest. I feel the bees know better than I. I'm only going to, I'm only going to cause problems for them if I, if I start moving things around. If you were inclined to do that, the time to do that would be kind of back in August um, when, the, when there's time to, for things to kind of settle. Um, you know, backfilling can occur around that brood nest. Um, but by the time we get to this point in the year, I, I find it better to just leave well enough alone and I'm likely going to do more harm than all right, next question. If I leave one super on top of two deeps, 10 frame hives, can or will the bees use the honey? And so here is where you really wanna think about what Megan explained about how we plan ahead about what the appropriate size is for our colony to overwinter in, where the cluster goes. Um, and so there are some beekeepers who really want to leave their honey supers on top of hives at this time of year. Uh, we encourage you to, uh, again, decide ahead of time, leave some boxes for the bees, and then plan on what you'll take as a beekeeper. Um, and so some of our main reasons for doing that is because the boxes that we use for honey supers, we want to make sure that those are really clean, that they don't get filled with sugar syrup instead of nectar, that they're not exposed to varroa treatments that aren't approved for use with honey supers on. Another big concern I have with people who want to leave a super on top of their hives right now is that um, it's possible that that super isn't fully drawn or is only partly full. And as bees move up through the winter, they can actually starve if they're not close to food. So if you have a partly full box that you want to leave on top of your hive, you might actually make it more difficult for your bees to move throughout the hive to honey when it's really cold. All right, what to do with frames of uncapped honey? So I'll start this one and then Adam will give some ideas as well. Um, so again, um, there's the danger of leaving partially filled boxes. We don't want uh, our bees to starve. We also, if it's really wet nectar, we don't want it to ferment. Uh, you can uncap, you can consider extracting uncapped honey. I know some beekeepers prefer to wait until all of the honey is capped, just to be sure. Um, but you can can extract it. Sometimes it's really dry and the bees just didn't cap it. Sometimes it's a little wet. So this is where it's really nice to have a refractometer. So you're able to check the moisture level of your colony. Um, if it's wet, you can either just eat it before it ferments. You can make mead or give it to someone who wants to make mead. Uh, or you could try to dry it out. So that's where you would put it in ideally some shallow tubs. So not the five gallon buckets. You want really shallow tubs where a lot of the honey is exposed to the air, and then you have it in a room with a fan, a dehumidifier, and a heater, and you stir the honey, and over time that can dry it out. Um, there's another way too, if it's really wet, that where you can put frames of uncapped honey above inner covers, and sometimes the bees will bring it down and use it as a feeder. This works some of the time. If it's really thick, they oftentimes don't move it. And then Adam, do you want to talk about routing stations? Yeah, so another thing that you can do with uncapped honey is you can just let the bees rob the, this uncapped honey out. There's a few cautionary tales, though, around robbing. And one of the things is, is that when you set up a robbing station where you're going to put your, your uncapped honey, um, what you want to make sure is that it's away from the yard. If you put this too close to your bee yard, the, the issue is, is that you can induce a, a robbing frenzy within the, yard, within the yard and really cause some issues. And that's not what we want to do. The other thing that you need to be aware of is that when you set this up, depending on where you're putting this, you need to be aware that this robbing station is going to attract 
a lot of bees, a lot of hornets, and you want to make sure that this doesn't become a nuisance. Um, so if you live in a city, you know, putting up a robbing station in your backyard might not be the best option because you may, you are going to attract a lot, a lot of activity in that area. And if that's going to be a concern for your neighbor, that's something to keep in mind. One of the things that I do, and, and I live in the Upper Peninsula on a farm, is, is, and so I have the space to move things around. What I do with our, with our robbing station is essentially I have our robbing station behind a tree line. So we have a big windbreak on our farm that has trees that are about 60 feet tall. And I have a one acre plot behind that, that tree line. And that's where we put our robbing station at. So it's a, it's a good distance, maybe, you know, four or 500 feet from the apiary, but there's a lot of obstacles in between that apiary and that robbing station. So that's some things to keep in mind with a robbing station. All right, so the next question. Going into winter, my bees have many frames of uncapped or partially capped honey. Also many frames of capped honey. I intend to let them eat their own honey through the winter. If I store the capped honey for later use, late winter or spring, is it okay to leave the uncapped or partially capped frames for their winter food? Or will it add to humidity or condensation risk? If I should not leave those frames in, what should I do with them? can't harvest contents as honey as it, as it will ferment in my limited experience. All right, so I'm gonna read the next question too. Um, so, okay, sorry, I'll, I'll go back there. So this goes back to our point and we've been getting a lot of questions from people who want to um, figure out what to do with these partly capped honey frames. Again, um, it might be okay just to go ahead and extract them. Um, and we do worry about having a lot of partly full frames right on top of the hive. Um, so if you can extract them, that's probably going to be your best bet there. In a single deep hive. And then this came in from a separate person who was curious about the biology of overwintering single deeps as opposed to double deep colonies. So um, among our group, we have pretty limited experience overwintering in single deeps. So this is Megan and I've done it a couple years, but in the times that I've overwintered single deeps, I've done it with splits that I've made in July. So I've let the bees grow into a single deep from basically the size of a nuke or they kind of were in a single deep. Um, so I split down a big colony in July into individual deep boxes. In Canada, they do a, a lot of overwintering in single deeps. And in the um, show notes on the webinar page, we'll add two links, one from the Ontario Beekeeper Association tech transfer team, and then another one from um, a beekeeper at the University of Guelph. And one of the things about the Canadian method is they're setting their colonies up the whole year to overwinter in single deeps. So they're retaining the brood nest as a single deep brood box. And for people who use only mediums, you know, you could kind of visualize this as two mediums. So it's really maintaining a smaller brood box. That's something that you can definitely try. One of the things to keep in mind is that when the, bee, when the beekeepers in Ontario do this, they're actually selecting four bees that work really well in, our, in that system. We have a lot of bees in Michigan that really hoard pollen really, really heavily. And I've had colonies that I've tried to get them to stay in a single brood nest and they filled up that whole bottom box with pollen and almost choked themselves out. The other thing is there is a little bit of genetic difference as to where the bees store the honey in relation to the brood nest. And the Ontario beekeepers program, at least, when they do their queen selection, um, honey placement, especially in terms of swarming, is a really big part of their selection. So they are choosing bees that kind of work with this system. So if it's a system that interests you and it doesn't work immediately, or it doesn't work on every single hive, that doesn't necessarily mean that you did it wrong or that the system's garbage. It may just be that the bees you have didn't fit it really well. The benefits of doing it in a single deep box is one, you know, you have fewer resources. 
maintaining the bees in a single deep throughout the summer and having a smaller brood nest does help manage Varroa a little bit um, because you don't have such a huge brood nest. But the, the reason that I really liked it personally was that it always allowed you to access the cluster. Um, so one of the issues that we have when we overwinter in you know, these five mediums or three deeps or things like that is that the cluster can sometimes get stuck in the middle and be in a place where it can't physically reach food, even if there's food you know, along the edges of the hive. Whereas if they're in a single deep, you can always put an emergency food patty or even a feeder pail or even a frame of honey right next to the cluster. And it's really easy to feed them. So for me, that's a really nice advantage. Um, but you do have to kind of be really considerate the whole summer long about how you get them into that single deep configuration. But I would definitely look at some of these Canadian resources afterwards. Okay, so the next question is, how many frames of honey are considered minimum for a July start hive to sustain them over the winter? So one of the things that I, I think that we probably need to, to understand is that a hive that started in July is not going to be a colony that you're harvesting honey from. It's not a honey producing hive. The, the July start, the goal is to get them as, as heavy as, they, as we can to, go, to sustain themselves over the course of winter. Um, so it really what you want, the, the answer to this is as much as you can get on them. So for a July hive start, you're gonna to need to have as much feed as you can on them. And a lot of times when you start these late hives, you know, feeding them consistently is part of that management strategy. Um, more to this question is some of the hives with three to four supers on them are not filled out with comb or honey. Um, so if you have three to four supers on top of this existing hive that have nothing in them, those, those are essentially they serve no purpose. They're, they're no, there's no resources in those areas. So you're gonna to wanna to take those off and you're gonna to wanna to consolidate all that into one specific box. Say if you have honey that's spread over the course of three to four boxes, bring that all down into one single box. The idea is that here is that as the bees move up as a cluster over the course of the season, what's gonna be happening is if they are moving up and they hit an area of the hive where there are not resources, meaning that there is not a band of honey there, they can starve in place. And so you wanna make sure that those boxes that are immediately above that cluster are completely filled with honey without any resource gaps in them. And the last part of that is, The last part of that was, is it appropriate to consolidate, uh, consolidate honey frames in the fewer supers for the winter? And the answer is. Okay, uh, next question we have says, when is the latest we should be reorganizing the frames? Meaning moving up and out, moving honey up and out in the two deep brood boxes. Um, so, Generally speaking, I you know usually like to kind of think having them in pretty good order before goldenrod flow, um, which most parts of the state is kind of the, the month of September or you know finishing by you know locally here it finished uh, about a week ago. Um, so that's kind of the last nectar flow of the year, and it's it's nice to let them use that last flow of the year to kind of backfill and configure as as they see fit. Um, in the absence of that, um, you know, beekeeper supply feed to help them backfill and, and pack things in. And I think this thought about reorganizing the brood nest, again, it's something we, we want to have done by the summer. I don't like to really alter their trajectory in a major way um, as, as we're going into the you know, fall and winter. Um, and let's, having said that, if there was a situation where like recently I had a, a colony that, that dropped a queen late in the season, uh, I made a comment, a newspaper combination on that. Um, so once those colonies had sort of combined together and were coexisting happily, then I did go ahead and, and move some frames around. But that was kind of a you know special circumstance, not just as a practice of normal colony management. So usually I think hands off in the 
brood nest manipulation, you know, as, as we get into the late summer. All right. So um, I'm just going to pause and go back because there's some follow-up questions about what we were talking about earlier as far as deciding whether or not you want to leave your supers on your hive. So if you have um, honey supers that you want to leave on for, for winter and they are full of honey, you can do that. The part that is difficult is that it's really easy as you move on in your beekeeping career to then have a hard time distinguishing which brood box, which box are exposed to feed and to mite treatments not approved for honey supers and which ones are for brood. So a lot of beekeepers, just to keep it really simple, just use deep sized boxes for their brood or just, and just use medium for honey surplus. If you're just running mediums, then normally you have a system to keep track of which boxes are for brood and for wintering and for feeding and then which boxes are just for surplus honey. So our advice typically is to plan that out ahead of time so you can keep track of your equipment and so that you aren't running the risk of then at some point extracting honey that is actually just capped syrup or is not fit for human consumption. If you have a medium super that is just partly full or partly drawn, the concern is that in the winter and when it's really cold, the bees cluster and they need to be very close to the honey in order to move to it. So they eat the honey in order to generate energy, which allows them to generate heat. And they will slowly move as a group to honey throughout the hive. If it's really cold and there isn't honey right next to the cluster, they will starve in place. So they will starve before they're able to move to a new place and get more honey in the hive. So what I get concerned about is sometimes beekeepers at the end of the season, um, they have a partly filled box of, of honey. The bees just didn't totally draw the frames out or fill those frames. And so then what I see going into winter is a lot of empty space that as the cluster moves up through the winter, and if it's really cold, they might have find themselves in a lot of places where they're just not next to honey or it's not easily accessible. So that's where the concern comes from for leaving partly filled boxes of honey on the hive. All right. So next question here is, if the bottom box is mostly empty, but with some pollen, should it be left on in the winter? So I would say yes, leave it on. It's gonna be much easier for you just to leave it on your hive than to figure out how you wanna store that box. Um, and that, because the bees kind of are already protecting it, it's gonna be exposed to some of those cold temperatures. And the bees will be able to use that space in the spring. In the spring, once the bees are kind of out of that and maybe more in that top box, you can go through that bottom box and decide which frames to call or which frame, frames to throw away. All right, so this is kind of a long one, um, but we'll talk it through because I think it's interesting to hear um, people's actual scenarios. So this beekeeper said, I've transitioned to using only six medium boxes. How many should I use to overwinter? I was thinking two for brood and one full of honey on top. Is that enough room for food? After a really slow spring and um, summer, my bees have really been going gangbusters lately. I probably have three brood or two or three honey boxes in each of the two hives. Should I consolidate three brood boxes into two or just leave alone? So I'm going to just start with this first half. Um, so how many we should use to overwinter? We'll all kind of give um, around what we're doing in our hives, but the, it depends on the size of the cluster. And you really, the big point that Anna was making is you want everything that you're leaving to be full. Um, so it's, it's much better to leave a really compact full hive than a really tall, loosely filled one um, in terms of honey. However, in terms of consolidating and moving brood around, it is pretty late to do that. Um, those are things that you can do kind of in August. Um, but for me personally, I generally try to get all the hives in the configuration that they're going to go through winter and then to get them, make sure everybody's set, the brood nest is appropriate before goldenrod. Most of the time when I say that, that means I'm not doing anything. Um, but I really don't mess around with the brood nest um, this late into the season. So I would say that you would err on the side of leaving the brood nest alone 
then trying to get in there and kind of move stuff around because with this last bit of um, nectar coming in, the bees are really going to put it where they want it to be. Um, and so it says if we should consolidate, what is the best way to do that? So the best way to do that is to do it earlier in the season, but usually I would just leave the brood nest alone. I have this, harvested no um, honey this spring or summer, and I was thinking of storing honey frames beyond one box to provide more food as needed over the winter spring. Are 10 frames enough to get through a normal winter, or should I leave two boxes of honey for them to overwinter? Um, so again, that depends on the size. So I have overwintered five frame nukes successfully, but that's a small colony. One of the standard numbers that gets thrown out for Michigan is to try to leave about 100 pounds of extra honey on the hive, which means your whole colony will weigh about 135 pounds. That's a whole hive weight with equipment and bees. And you can just take a bathroom scale and put them on and see if they weigh that. Um, usually that is fine in about two deeps, which is about three or four mediums. If you're conservative, you can do, so this year, I don't have time to feed my bees and I don't wanna deal with it. So I just left three deeps on. So my top deep is full of honey for them. Um, and, but I, well, we'll talk about feeding next, but so three deeps is what I'm doing this year, but we just heard that a lot of people can do it in single deeps. So there's not like one right answer of what size it needs to be. It's more making sure that they're in kind of a compact space for the size of your cluster and that there's enough food left over for the size of your cluster. So I think, Megan, you said that we'll talk a little bit about how we're overwintering hives. Uh, so I can tell you that for MSU, a lot of our hives are in eight frame equipment and they're in three deeps. And some of that is just that it means that we have less feeding to do. And some of the reason is because the spring we had to treat with antibiotics. So there are a lot of boxes that we can only use for brood and overwintering and that we can't use for honey, surplus honey. Um, so that's for MSU. We also have some hives that are in two deeps, 10 frame equipment. For, yeah, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, um, I can just, what my setup currently um, got everything in uh, not everything, most in too deep, 10 frame equipment. Um, again, really just, you know, packed out top box full of honey at this point, syrup and honey. Um, and then there are a few in three deeps as, as I've had this kind of late season, I've, I've dropped a few queens. So I've kind of, you know, made some newspaper combined. So there's a, there's a few in three deeps, but two deep, 10 frame is kind of my standard brood nest. And I would say definitely it depends, like Megan said, on the colony size as far as how much honey and space they'll need for the winter. Uh, but for a lot of our standard size colonies, we're looking for about 75 to 100 pounds of stored honey or syrup. So we'll talk about feeding in a bit. But maybe Adam, do you want to talk about how you're overwintering your hives? Yeah, so um, we use all eight frame medium equipment in our apiary and we generally are shooting for a minimum. I like to do four uh, mediums uh, deep generally in the winter on some of my colonies that I know are just more robust colonies. They have big, big colonies going into the winter as far as cluster size. I will, I like to have those with five mediums. And so generally four to five mediums is, is what I'm shooting for as I'm going into winter and we've been feeding um, about the last, I'd say probably three to four weeks we've been feeding to kind of get them to backfill those brood chambers. And, um, and yeah, they're all, they're all got a lot of weight on them now. I, I would say like, you know, when you get to that point where you start to understand that we're talking about having the entire colony kind of just totally compact and full of resources, um, you can really tell when they get, when they get full uh, just by, you know, grabbing one of those handholds and picking up the sides of it. Um, and you'll feel that, you know, as you keep bees longer and longer that, that's a good reference point is, is how, how heavy that thing is and how solid that hive sound. In the chat about these, so we, I think we've addressed some of those, but if I've, um, if we don't get to your questions about um, space and restructuring, we'll have time at the end too. Um, but I think it'll be nice just to, to reiterate these, even if we did address them. Um, 
so one of the questions from Stephanie was, should I remove all the honey supers before winter? Currently considering leaving a full one for the bees in the winter, is that too much space? So I'll do this one and then I'll assign the other ones. But I think um, hopefully we kind of just covered that, but there isn't necessarily too much space, but you do want to think about springtime. Um, and so if the two deeps, if you feel like they're not empty enough or you're worried, you can have that medium up there, but then you are really committing that medium to being a brood box or committed to the animals in the springtime um, because they will start laying in it and you will have pollen stored in it and it'll really change the structure of the combs, which will be important when we talk about the comb storage as well. The other thing to keep in mind where it feels like naturally you wanna just leave all the honey for the bees and not deal with it till spring we have to remember that it's springtime, the bees are going to need space first and foremost. And we do have a webinar on dealing with bees in spring, but they really do actually need tons of drawn comb in the springtime. And so you have to make this really quick transition between them potentially not having enough space to bring in incoming food once incoming food is. So it is really learning your area, learning your honey flows, learning what is an appropriate size um, to have them over winter in. And a lot of that does just come with experience, which is years of work. Um, there's another question that says, my bees never filled the upper box, so there's nothing there, only empty frames. Will they survive? Should I take off the upper box? Anna, do you wanna do that one? Sure. So uh, I guess I would be inclined to take off the, the empty box. If they're not drawn frames, you definitely wanna take that off. That is just empty space. Um, if they are drawn frames, but they're empty and you're planning on doing a lot of feeding, you could feed so that the bees fill up that empty comb with syrup, but that's a lot of syrup. And I guess it depends if it's a medium or a deep size box. Um, ideally, what you should do is just, I would do, I think in your case, is take off the empty box and then just feed lots of syrup so the bees are able to store enough food in the area that they're maintaining right now. Excellent. And there is one that's really similar, um, but it's nice to hear it in other people's words. So in reference to the question we just answered, I have one hive that didn't draw out their second deep, but they're really low on honey stores. I've been feeding a lot, but I'm still concerned about them. And this might be jumping ahead, but should I just combine them with another hive? Um, Anna, do you want to do that one too? Sure, so um, I, I guess part of it, I, my curiosity is why your bees weren't able to really store enough food. And so some of it might have been, if, if they're just a small colony to begin with, then maybe it makes sense for you to combine them with a stronger colony that does have enough food for both of them. Um, if it's a disease issue and that's kind of why they weren't really strong enough to fill up their boxes, then that's something that you would wanna pay attention to. So it might be worth doing a grow account before you consider doing any kind of combinations. You can continue to feed them syrup, um, but if, it, yeah, again, you, you wanna make sure that they're going to have the right amount of food going into winter. And if they're not getting there, uh, you might wanna consider doing a combination. Excellent. And then there's one more that's kind of on this topic. Um, it says, can you confirm a ratio I've heard for overwintering? For every frame of brood, we should have two frames of honey. So a one to two ratio of brood to food. Um, has anyone on the panel heard this? It, no. It, it's not something I've come across, that, especially this time of year, the amount of brood is so dynamic that what it was two weeks ago is going to be vastly different from what it is now and two weeks from now. Yeah, that's a really good point. And that's kind of what I was going to say is it depends. Um, but I think you can kind of use it as a guideline when you set them up for smaller colonies. Um, you know, so if you're making up a nuke, for example, with two frames of brood earlier, a lot of times they say like, well, you want to have at least two frames of honey in there. But it is hard at this time of year because the amount of brood that we have is really um, switching. The other thing is um, as we get into feeding, the amount of um, honey in there and the amount of food that they're going to need is really going to depend on
the weather and genetics and things like that. All right, so that seems to be all the questions that we have on consolidating and what to do with um, honeycombs if we wanna go on to feeding. And I don't know um, if we wanna jump right into it or if we wanna talk about what we're doing for feeding. Yeah, let's talk about it. So depends on uh, the situation. So our colonies for MSU, a lot of them are in three deeps and just have tons of honey. So that top deep is full of honey. This box is either full of honey or almost full of honey. And so a lot of them already have a good amount of food and won't need to be fed um, to, for winter stores. For, or, yeah, Dan, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, for, for for our own bees, um, as I said, we kind of uh, run double deeps. Um, we like the frame feeders. The internals, the, the top picture here, that's a frame feeder with the cap and ladder, which is a vast improvement on just the open frame feeder that tended to warp and twist and end up with a lot of drowned bees. Um, I like the frame feeder because I can get weight on quickly. They'll, a big strong colony this time of year, um, they'll empty that in 24 to 36 hours a gallon. Um, typical approach, everything gets two gallons of feed, um, you know, as soon as the supers are off, uh, just to kind of help them, you know, pack in around the brood nest and close things down, put it where they want it. And then it's selective beyond that based on if they need a little more, but most of them having run in a double deep for the, the year, have a pretty good amount of weight in that, that top box. So it's, it's more about configuration than really adding lots and lots of pounds. So that's kind of our approach. Adam, you want to go next? Yeah, as far as feeding's concerned, um, we do internal feeders as well. I, I have a whole hodgepodge of things that I use for internal feeders. I have bucket feeders. I have a lot of quart mason jars and I'll you know pack four of those in a in a box on top of a colony um, but yeah generally kind of the same method that Dan kind of laid out um, after we're done with honey I'll generally um, throw on feed onto uh, the colonies and for usually about a gallon or two to most of them and then if there are any other subsequent colonies that I feel kind of just need a little bit more of a resource boost um, as far as what they're packing in uh, to make sure that everything is real packed solid um, I may add another gallon or two, um, but generally right around now, everything is, has been fed. We're not, we're, we're not on liquid feed right now in our apiary. We're actually going to be taking all that equipment off uh, this weekend. So, um, so yeah, everything's right about where it should be right now. And how about you, Megan? Excellent. Yeah. So for me, the amount of feeding I do in the fall is entirely dependent on really goldenrod. I'm in Jackson County and we have tons of it, but whether or not I get a lot of goldenrod is really weather dependent. And sometimes I can make honey off of it. Sometimes we get nothing and sometimes, you know, they eat it, but they don't really store it. And this year felt like for me, um, most of my yards were in that third category. So there was definitely a lot of nectar coming in really until like the last couple of days, um, you know, today being really cold. And, but we're basically done with food where I am. And so I'm not necessarily, my bees are sitting really fat right now. Like I said, like I have, you know, two deeps that are pretty heavy plus a third deep of full cap on top. Um, so that's really generous for what they're going to need. Whether or not I feel like I'm going to have to feed over the next month is really going to depend on the weather. You know, so right now today was pretty chilly and the bees aren't using that much food. But if we have these falls um, like we've been having where it's 75 and sunny through October, then I know that the bees are going to use a lot of resources and there's not a lot of food in the environment. Um, I use these bucket feeders that you see pictured here. Um, I just have migratory covers with a hole on top and I just put the bucket right on top of the hive. The only thing I feel really strongly about at this time of year is that the bees have to be able um, to access a lot of food. So that's why like these buckets have a screen so a lot of bees can get to them. Those feeders that um, Dan and um, Adam said they were using the bee, like lots of bees can eat at them at the time. So the bees can really move food quickly right now. Oh, 
Okay, so we'll move into, we have some, um, you know, more specific questions on feeding um, and say we've all kind of just laid out our general approach, but the question come in, what's the difference between one to one and two to one? When do you feed them? Um, so when, when beekeepers talk about um, syrup, it's, it's a sugar to water. So one to one equal parts sugar to water, two to one, twice as much sugar to water. Um, if you want to be precise about it, you working in weights, not volume, but there's not a lot of difference in, in, the, uh, in the density of, of sugar and water. So they're fairly equivalent. Um, as far as when to use each one, um, certainly in the fall this time of year, we're going to be looking at the, the heavier syrup, the two to one. I also would say some beekeepers will just call light syrup and heavy syrup, one to one, two to one. Um, for one thing with the heavy syrup, there's less moisture in it for the bees to uh, have to evaporate. As, as, as we think about them getting into winter, we don't want to have a lot of, you know, empty, or sorry, not empty, but uncapped uh, food stores in the comb. It's just a more high humidity environment that's a little more stressful. So has, starting with a more sugar, lower moisture uh, feed helps them with that. Also, um, the heavy syrup like that is, is not going to have like a, a stimulating effect like nectar would, where some people don't want to feed in the fall because they think they're going to push their bees forward when they should be shutting down. So that, that's why we want to use the, the heavy two to one um, or thereabouts uh, this time of year. And then in the spring is more when we'll be looking at a, a lighter syrup possibly. Okay, we have another question. Uh, it says, when should a beekeeper in Michigan stop feeding two to one syrup in the fall? So good, we got feeding the heavy syrup. Um, short answer I always kind of think is when the bees stop taking it. Um, sometimes that's just a function of when they run out of room. Um, they just physically don't have any more comb space to put it in. They should be good provided, you know, they're in a, a couple boxes if that's filled up. Um, you know, once it gets cold and freezing, they're just, not really going to take liquid feed. Um, there is, as we kind of look at this, you know, this month ahead of us, October here, there, there is a little difference in, in fall feeding. There's kind of two purposes. One would be feeding for what the bees are consuming. And just as Megan mentioned a minute ago about, you know, today bee activity pretty minimal in much of the state with kind of cold, blustery, drizzly, but we get these, you know, 70 plus degree days as we do, and that's more activity and the bees are going to be consuming um, more of those stores. So that's a case where feeding to just kind of maintain um, is, is useful. But when we think about winter weight, we really want to get that feed on them early. We want to bulk them up. And then if we have to feed to maintain that weight, that's, that's okay. Um, we want the winter weight early. The other um, aspect, is, you know, it, it is a lot easier to, to feed syrup in the fall than candy boards um, in the winter. So I think there's, I saw a question in the chat, we'll address about candy boards as well. But um, yeah, we, we tend to give them feed until they stop taking it. Right. And that point about the, the fall feed being easier for them to access, uh, the bees are storing that syrup in the comb the same way they store nectar in the comb. So that winter cluster can uh, when it's on the comb, it can just access the food right there. Uh, sometimes if you're trying to feed with candy board or fondant on top, that's a lot more difficult for a cluster to be able to access, depending on how cold it is. All right, is it also okay to share frames of honey with other colonies? So yes, if you have a colony that's light on food and you have another colony that has a lot of honey frames, you can share frames um, between your colonies. We recommend only doing it in the same yard because we're worried about disease transmission. Uh, the other caveat is that American foul brood spores can be in honey. So if you do have a colony that has had American foul brood, you definitely wouldn't want to share honey between hives, but hopefully you've already dealt with that. And um, this is another reminder of why we don't buy honey from the supermarket and feed it to our bees because it could have those American foul brood spores. We just don't know. Excellent. So there are a couple questions um, regarding feeding in the Q&A still. Um, so Dan, you talked about the two-in-one syrup, but someone said that they've been using the two-to-one, but mixing it has been challenging. Um, do you want to talk about like how you mix it up? Yeah. Um, 
So warm, hot water um, certainly helps, but you, you don't want to boil it. You definitely don't want to put it on the stove and, and uh, cook it. Um, you, you will develop some um, you know, issues in the syrup that may be problematic for the bees, but warm water certainly helps it dissolve. Um, I typically just mix it up in a five gallon bucket. You know, I don't fill it up right to the rim. Um, you know, maybe get four and a half gallons in or so. Um, and with hot water, you know, stir it for a few minutes. You can kind of tell when the granulation disappears. That, that is one aspect um, of the frame feeder. If, if the open feeding like that, if there's a little bit of granulation left, it's not gonna be particularly problematic. With a bucket feeder, if there's granulation in the sugar, it can tend to clog those those screens or holes in the lid. Um, but it just it takes a few minutes and hot water basically. And one thing too, it depends on how hot your home's water is. But it, you can heat up a small amount on the stove and mix that in too. If you're just not getting water that's hot enough to get it to dissolve. person has them in two broods, um, deep boxes, and they're only eating about one quarter of four gallons of two to one syrup a week. Would you think that there is a problem? Um, Dan and Anna, if you guys want to address that too. Sure. So that, I don't know if we have all the information we need to answer that question. I guess um, one possibility is that they already have filled their comb and they just don't have very much space to store that syrup. Um, so that could be a possibility. Another possibility is just that the colony is not really strong in population, so it's not able to, to move syrup very quickly. Um, so there's a couple of thoughts. It could also have to do with your feeder. Sometimes there's certain feeders that it's just easier for bees to move syrup out of. So like Dan said, the, the frame feeder can be a way, nice way to get a lot of syrup into bees. The bucket feeders can be good, but if you're getting uh, sugar, too much sugar, and that's blocking the screen, that could be an issue. That's excellent. And that kind of leads to our next question from Terry. If you can only use like one top feeder mason jar style. Um, and I think that you maybe explained it there is that sometimes with just one mason jar on top, the bees can't really bring it down very quick. And it also can, those mason jar holes, if they get clogged, the bees maybe aren't accessing all the food. Um, so it is really nice to have a feeder style that the bees, many bees can feed at it at once, and it isn't likely to get clogged if that sugar does um, crystallize. But if, the, if it's at your house and you can switch it out often, you can just use like one mason jar, but do keep in mind um, that your bees maybe need a lot of food. Like if you're trying to get them up to weight, it could be gallons. Um, and so if you have the labor to replace one mason jar, you know, get gallons and gallons in the high one mason jar at a time, you can do that. But usually a bigger feeder with lots of holes is what we're looking for at this time. Um, and then Dan, there's a question. I've read that it's best to stop feeding two to one sugar syrup by October 1st in Michigan. I have some top feeders with floats. Is the October 1st syrup rule based on weather? Or is this the best time of year to switch to sugar? Do you want to, I think you kind of touched on that, but do you want to just? Yeah, it, it's a little, it, I hesitate anytime there's a hard date put out there. The answer is always, it depends. Michigan is extremely variable um, climatically. Um, so, so that's going to depend a little. Just personally, um, I have a little bit of feeding left to do liquid, liquid syrup um, over the course of the next week. I mean, I, I think definitely the mindset of, Earlier is better, um, but I, I yeah, I, I don't think having a hard date on the calendar um, like that is, is necessary. I look at the, the feeding of sugar or candy board fun. I look at that not as really a fall feeding, but as a, as a winter time if you're out there in, you know, maybe February or so and you see the bees are getting light. That's, that's when I would be looking to use the dry sugar feed. All right, and then Adam, Brad says, I have two full medium honey supers that are full of capped honey. I was told to leave it for the bees as a first year keeper. Two brood boxes are pretty packed with capped and uncapped as well. Do I need to feed or can I leave them alone? 
So in this situation, Brad, it sounds like you've got a lot of honey on this colony. If you have two brood boxes that are, that are backfilled for the most part with honey, and then two full medium supers that have capped honey, you're looking at upwards of, you know, close to probably 200 pounds of honey on this colony. So you have plenty of honey on there um, if this is the situation that you're seeing where you're essentially completely filled um, in those boxes. So feeding at that point really is not necessary. You've got plenty of resources on there. I would like to say it is very important for first year beekeepers to actually taste the honey off of their hives. So if, you've, if this means that you haven't taken any of it, you should at least taste a frame so you get to enjoy it too. Um, I believe that's all of the um, questions that we have that are, oh, there's one more question relating to feeding. And it says, does anyone use beet juice for feeding? And if so, where do you get it? Um, and we didn't talk about sugars, but I don't know, Dan, do you want to talk about the different sugars that we use? Or I have opinions. Uh, so I, I'm wondering, I, I certainly would not feed my bees beet juice um, or any, anything really besides sugar. They have, they have solids and other things in them that the bees just are not um, capable of digesting. I am wondering a little bit if they mean beet sugar um instead of beet juice um that's possibly so as far as the, there's some you know debate and feelings amongst beekeepers with beet sugar versus cane sugar um there's different they're they're as far as the bees are concerned um and chemistry is concerned beet sugar and cane sugar is identical it's a it's a molecule it's the same thing um your bees aren't going to be able to tell the difference so one of those is what i would look to be making your syrup out of this time of year and if you're going to make um you know fondant or whatever it is for winter feed um you know just plain old grocery supermarket sugar um but yeah you want to avoid any anything raw sugars beet juice, fruit juice, anything like that that's going to have solids or other things in it. Bees are not going to tolerate that. Yeah, and the person did follow up and said that they had heard that it, they actually meant straight beet juice. And I really want to, Dan's point is really important. Um, bees don't have super sophisticated digestive systems. And so anytime you stray away from something that they normally eat, and especially in the winter when they can't take a good poop for months and months and months, we want to be really careful um, with their digestion. And so even if it doesn't have solids or anything like that, what will end up happening is it will have ash content, which is basically things that bees, it's what's left over after you digest it. And bees can digest sucrose, which is table sugar, very easily. That's part of the things they have enzymes to digest it. But anytime you move away into any other thing besides sugars, um, it's going to be really difficult. So we don't recommend putting in any additives or anything that's not really just straight sugar. And again, we're doing the sugar to supplement the fact that they already have um, lots of honey on it. All right, so I think that's all on the fall feeding right now. I think we'll leave the winter um, emergency feeding till the others if we get to it or at the very end so we can go on to hive wrapping. All right, so what we're doing right now to prepare for winter. So, or what we, sorry, what we are going to do to prepare for winter. Um, so one of the things is adding mouse guards um, mice will move in in the fall to our hives. It's a nice little, little cozy place for them. They'll oftentimes coexist right next to your cluster of bees and they'll make a nest and they'll chew on the, the frames with pollen and make a mess of those frames. Um, I highly recommend adding mouse guards or rodent guards to your hives because if you're like me, you might scream in the spring if you all of a sudden get startled by a mouse. And also like you really don't want your beekeeping equipment to be full of mouse poop. I just personally don't appreciate that. So um, one thing that's really easy to use is just a quarter inch hardware cloth and staple that to the entrances so bees can still come and go easily, but rodents can't move in. Um, that also prevents shrews from co um, coming in and eating your bees. Uh, but there's a lot of other mouse guards that you can buy that are available commercially as well. So just something to block the entrances and then we'll be wrapping our hives for winter as well. Megan, do you wanna talk about that piece? 
Um, and I am doing the hardware cloth. And that is one thing that I do take really, really seriously um, because learning through experience, I've had lots of problems with mice getting in and ruining a lot of stuff. Um, beyond that, I'm not doing anything else. Um, so all of my hives are set up right now with, um, like I said, like it's just the regular hive. There's a spacer on top um, so that they have an upper entrance and that's it. Um, so I'm not doing any sort of wrapping or cozies or anything um, like that. It is really just mouse guards is all I'm doing right now. have very strong opinions about wrapping and things like that but one of the things I want people to keep in mind um, when they are thinking about covering the hive is a lot of people really want to focus on like keeping the bees warm and insulating the hive and these are two photos that really show how efficient bees are insulating themselves um, so you can see in the upper right hand photo the thermal image um, that Rusty Burlew took is that the cluster is really, really warm, like it's white and hot in the middle. And then you can see that the temperature of the hive itself is the same as the outside temperature. On the left is a figure from the ARS lab in Madison from 1974, um, the thermology of winter bees. And you can see they had all these little temperature um, indices in there where they're measuring the temperature. And you can see it's really warm in the center where it's 93, 92 degrees, but it quickly drops to the outside temperature right outside the cluster. Um, so a lot of people feel that they need to insulate the hive to keep the bees warm. But what's much more important is that the bees have a nice big strong cluster so they can create this insulating cluster themselves. All right, so this is a question we're all going to take. The question is, what's up with insulation versus wrap versus thicker wood versus leaving alone? Uh, so let's start there. Uh, Adam, do you want to start? Yeah, so, um, so yeah, what is up with insulation versus wrapping versus uh, thicker wood versus leaving it alone? Well, as Megan just kind of illustrated um, through those figures is that when we're thinking about how bees are thermoregulating over the course of the winter, the cluster is what is being thermoregulated. They're not heating the inside of the hive. And that's, I think, something that a lot of people get confused about. So when we're talking about insulation and wrapping and the thickness of wood on the hives, it does play a role in retaining heat for that cluster. So if they do have you know, a, a, a bit of insulation under the, the, uh, the top cover, that allows that rising heat not to be lost so readily. So like, for example, in my own personal apiary, um, again, I'm in the UP, um, I put a two inch piece of uh, pink foam insulation right on the um, inside of my top cover. And the reason for that is that about, and, and if anybody else on here, uh, panelist wise, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe about 75% of the heat that is lost in hives, as far as um, heat loss is concerned, is through the top. And so most of your heat is being lost at the top. So if you're gonna insulate anything, generally you wanna make sure that that top cover is insulated, um, is insulated uh, if you are going to insulate. However, you don't have to insulate um, and you don't, you don't have to wrap either. Oftentimes a healthy hive that is in a good, a good uh, orientation as far as resources are concerned can live just fine. As far as thicker wood is concerned, this kind of gets back to the whole um, heat loss thing. So if you have about 75% of your heat loss being lost at the top of the hive, you have about 25% on the outside. So it does, it allows the, the colony to maintain a little more of that heat. So it's not losing as much, which means essentially it's going to it's going to use less honey um, as it's trying to maintain uh, that thermoregulation of the colony. Wrapping, as far as wrapping is concerned, Wrapping is not insulation. Wrapping, if for, at least in my opinion, is something that is more for the, the springtime when we're coming out of the winter, where we're allowing some of that heat to be absorbed on those days where we're getting you know, fluctuations in temperatures, where we're getting those, those 50 degree weeks during the spring. Having the wrap on there as far as the black uh, tar paper is concerned, allows for that heat to be absorbed during those times and for the cluster ex to expand a little bit. So those are a little bit of two different things in my opinion. 
What are some other opinions on this? So this is Megan and I also, most of my hives, um, I really don't do anything to. And um, going to the, the, the tops of them too, like right now I have an upper entrance on them. For me, that's more important just in case the bottom gets filled with dead bees that they have a way to get out. Um, but I've been really enjoying reading um, Bill Hesbach's writing on the condensing colony, which we can add to the show notes at the end or people can Google it. But one of the things that's really important to remember is your bees actually do need water in the hive. And um, as Adam mentioned, you know, most of the heat is going to go straight up if any does escape the cluster. And what you want is that water doesn't condense directly above the colony. So that kind of gets to the, the next question about insulated tops versus quilt boxes versus insulation boards. Um, so sorry, Anna, I'm skipping ahead. But um, in the condensing colony theory, the idea is that if you have just a little bit of insulation at the top, it allows the water to condense on the sides. And it is important to keep in mind that bees actually do need water in the winter time. Um, they drink it because they're animals. They also use it to reliquify crystallized honey. So having water in the hive in itself is not deadly to bees as long as it's running down the sides or safely out the bottom and not dripping back down on the cluster. But I definitely have colonies that live very happily through Michigan winters when I do nothing to them between October and March. But again, that goes back to the fact that I've put in a lot of work through the fall to make sure that everybody has a lot of food and a nice strong cluster. So, and when I say through the fall, I mean like from May all the way through the fall. Great. Yeah, I think we get this question a lot because beekeepers hear that about how many colonies beekeepers lose over the winter. So they think there must be something really important as far as setting them up for winter or a special way to wrap them to stay warm. And that's really not why we're, we're losing a lot of our colonies. So most of our, the colonies that we lose over the, over the winter just weren't healthy enough going into winter or didn't have enough honey or food stored going into winter. So those are our main reasons why we lose colonies in the winter. Um, so I've done wintering a few different ways. I've used the black wax cardboard wraps um, I've used fiberboard as moisture boards. I've also used winter cozies as wraps. Um, if you want just like a couple of simple methods for wintering hives, on our webinar webpage, I did link to two methods that the University of Minnesota has. Um, they're wintering colonies and cold winters up there. Uh, so if you're looking for just this tried and true method that's been used quite a bit, you can reference those guides. But again, really, we know that this is this is not where we put a lot of our time thinking about because we want our bees to be healthy going into winter. We're not really focused on the wrapping piece of it. <clears throat> and so if it makes them feel better. And so if you need to do it to make yourself feel better, that's totally fine. Sorry. So this next question came in um, on the, the same topic, um, says, I'm interested in people's experience with effectively winterizing hives, best practices for insulation and best practices for moisture boards, DIY and purchased. I use tar paper to insulate year one bees and they survived. I use tar paper to insulate year two, year two bees and they did not. I tried a DIY moisture board year three and they did not. I supplemented tar paper with old Christmas tree windbreak on year two. And so the main thing is here, um, you know, trying different things, did the same thing year one and two, bees survived, bees didn't. The, the, the point is it's, these things don't make that big of a difference. What really makes a difference is, is doing the work throughout the year to ensure that you have big, robust, healthy bees right now. You're not gonna, you know, limp a weak colony through by, by wrapping it up in some material. And there, there was a question, um, so that one mentioned using old Christmas trees. Um, this one talks about overwintering and straw bales for wind barriers. So the, the insulation doesn't make a huge difference. Having piercing winds going into the hive can make a difference. Um, I did add this photo, which is um, from the University of Wisconsin um, College of Ag. 
document where they actually overwintered colonies in screened hives. So that hive is actually made out of screen. And they did it for two years and they did four colonies like this. The first year the colonies died in February because a huge windstorm came up and the wind actually cooled the bees on the outside of the cluster so quickly that they dropped to the ground and froze and the cluster got smaller and smaller. Um, when they moved them out of the wind, these colonies that were in screened hives were actually able to survive through the winter. And this is in Wisconsin, and this was even through brood rearing, they maintained similar temperatures. Um, so if you do have hives that are highly ventilated, like some of mine are with um, lots of co corner and um, entrances, i.e. rotted corners, then it might make sense to you know, put up straw bales or put up a windbreak or to wrap them in tar paper just to prevent the wind from blowing through the colony. But if you've got nice tight equipment um, and you're not in direct wind blowing through the entrance, then it, it shouldn't be that big of a deal. Um, so you don't, if you, you know, are in an area with a ton of wind, you can get some straw bales or a windbreak. But if you're in a pretty sheltered area, um, your bees should be just fine. All right, we're moving on to queen issues and combining colonies. We've been getting a lot of questions recently. So um, this really, dealing with queen issues falls into the category of things that we've already done to prepare for winter. It's getting pretty late to deal with these queen issues. Um, so later, at this point in the season, it would be really difficult for a colony to accept a new queen. So I know there's some beekeepers that find out that their colony is queenless and want to introduce a new, new queen and it's very unlikely that that queen would be accepted. Uh, what's a much better strategy for this time of year is combining colonies. And so we use the newspaper combination method to combine colonies and there's a resource for that linked on our webinar website. Uh, one word of caution is that you want to think about why colonies might be weak right now. So if they're weak because they were a late season split or because they had a queen issue and you have a you understand why they are small then and you've checked their varroa levels then they're fine to combine with your other colonies but if they're weak because they are all of a sudden crashing from mites or viruses or have been unhealthy you don't want to combine sick colonies with healthy colonies you don't want to spread disease All right, so this question is, when do honeybees begin to raise winter bees in Michigan and what causes them to raise winter bees? And then there's a question in the Q&A about whether or not it's feeding um, syrup that causes them to do it. So we don't know everything um, about winter bees. We do know that they are really important in that they're the only generation of bees that are going to survive all the way through the winter and be the ones who are going to raise that first generation of brood in the spring. So they're the most important bees that you have. They're likely being created about now in most of Michigan. Um, they are going to have these extra fat deposits. They're going to have more vitelligenin. They're going to have a completely different life cycle than most of our summer bees. We don't know exactly what drives them to be created. Um, they used to think that it was changes in photo period that doesn't seem to make an effect what it does seem to be linked with um, a lessening in protein coming in. And so it's likely an adaptation that as bees move further north into climates that didn't have consistent food, they had to be able to store the protein and the fats within their body, rather than counting on it coming in. So it kind of makes sense as food becomes less available that the bees are going to shift to creating this generation. One thing to keep in mind though, is that's going to be you know, fats and proteins. That's not necessarily going to be nectar. Um, so feeding the sugar water won't affect the development of winter bees. It doesn't seem that feeding pollen substitute really creates it or changes it, um, but it, it is probably the changing of incoming fresh pollen from flowers that does kind of um, start the bees to create winter bees. So we do still have a lot to, to learn about that. All right, so this question is, I recently discovered that one of my hives is queenless. 
what are my options at this time? Is it too late in the year to get another queen? Um, well, the simple answer to that is yes. Um, it is, it's way too late to be dealing with queenless issues at this time of the season. And like uh, Anna had just mentioned earlier, uh, this time of the year, if you do introduce a queen, most of the time they're not going to accept that queen. So it is too late. What your option is at this time of the season really is to combine the hive with the other hive. Um, so you're, so you're going to, so that's, we've talked about it, I think on several different points, doing a newspaper combined with them um, to the other colony. The one thing to keep in mind though here is that is the, you should be thinking to yourself, is this colony actually queenless? Because we are getting to the time of the year where some of my colonies have already shut down for the season and there's no brood in there. So if I did, went out and did an inspection right now on some of my colonies, I wouldn't actually be able to tell if, it, if there was a queen there or not because they've already completed that winter bee um, rearing and now they're in a broodless condition. So that's something to keep in mind is that, are you actually seeing a queenless condition or is, has your colony just shut down for the season? And one of the ways that you, know, that you can tell those types of things is by keeping good notes when you're doing inspections on your colonies. Um, but Primarily, if this is just a tra tra traditional queenless situation, your really only option this time of the season is to combine it with another hive. All right. And so uh, one point we want to make is that we've already done a lot of varroa management throughout the season as part of our preparing our bees to be healthy to get through the winter. So I know at this point of the year, it can be a little bit of frustrating because if you didn't manage your row throughout the season, um, it's, there's still things you can, ways you can treat, but it might be um, that your bees are already carrying a high disease load and might be less likely to make it through the winter, but it's something to pay attention to for next year. The, the really important part of having bees winter successfully is making sure that they're healthy and a huge part of that is managing varroa throughout the beekeeping season. They're a little out of order. Um, so this is, I recently inspected my four hives to evaluate getting them ready for winter and was surprised to see a lot of cat brood and young larvae still. The more I thought about it, or more than I thought there would be at this time, and there were quite a few capped drone cells. I thought that the drones were supposed to be given the boot this time of year. Is this normal? Um, so we've talked about this a lot amongst our group because we're seeing all sorts of things. The amount of brood that you have in your colony at this time of year is dependent on a lot of things. How young your queen is, the genetics of that particular type of bee, a lot of environmental factors, and also the health of the colony. Um, so one of the things is if the colony is really struggling, there's a lot of people who think that they can maybe, like if they don't have enough healthy winter bees, that they'll try to raise brood later in the season. Um, there's also, you know, genetic things that different bees will shut down earlier. So the thing that is normal is to see lots of different things. Even amongst my bees, I was out this weekend and some had totally shut down and some still had large brood nests. Um, so it is a, is a really diverse time of year. Um, so lots of things can be normal. Great, so we're going to move on to equipment storage here. All right, Megan, you want to take this, or Megan or Adam, you want to take this one? Getting close to the end, and I have the slides out of order for Varroa. If we could go down to the two on Varroa, I think that might be the most important thing, and then we might have to bump a lot of the rest of the questions to our next webinar. Sure. Uh, is this what you're thinking, Megan? Um, so there was the one that I have it as slide 42, I think, about the person who bought the two hives from the relative. 40, sorry, which one? 42. Keep going. Okay, there. Um, I moved them out of order. I know you guys can get a preview of all the cool stuff we're going to see. Here we go. There we go. This one. Great. All right. Love talking about Varilla. So this past weekend, we bought two hives from a relative. When picking them up, they said they have not done mite treatments yet. What's the best treatment this time of year? So this is a really tricky situation to have two colonies that haven't been managed for mites throughout the year. Uh, a lot of times that we would 
advise you to lower your expectations for their survival because if their mite levels and virus levels are really high, even if you are able to get the mites under control, um, it's still possible that you're, they would carry a high disease load and not make it through the winter. So uh, one thing you can do to start is doing a mite test. We have a lot of resources online at keepbeesalive.org and that might give you an idea of where you're sitting at as far as your mite loads. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. Another thing is that even if the mite loads are really high and even if you don't expect your colonies to make it through the winter, it's still really important to treat for mites. Mites spread between colonies and they spread on bees. So if you all of a sudden have a colony that's really high on mites, we don't want you to just say, okay, I give up and leave it alone. What we really want you to do is try to manage those mites, get the mite levels down so they're not spreading to other healthier colonies. So once you do your mite test and kind of have a sense of where you're at, um, you'll be thinking about treatments. If you have an opportunity to do a formic acid treatment, that's one option our group would recommend. Uh, this time of year, it's really important to pay attention to temperatures and forecasts when you're picking a treatment, but uh, you could do a formic acid treatment because that can be a relatively short treatment. You could follow up with a thymol-based treatment. And then for all of our colonies, we're planning on doing an oxalic acid dribble at the end. And that's not designed to really save us from a high level of mites. It's more designed to be a cleanup treatment. And on our webinar website, we do have posted the label for an oxalic acid treatment. And then um, here, Adam has a slide uh, that has some of the temperature requirements for our different treatment options. Yeah, and I won't, I won't go through this this you know in detail because we are running against the clock but what I will, what I just want to underscore is is kind of what what Anna had had mentioned you know one of the things you want to make sure that you're considering when you're doing these mite treatments is that all of these mite treatments have labels and they're these labels are developed to to be to make you successful these companies want to see you be successful in using their products and so you have to follow these labels and the temperature requirements come into these labels very, very big. And so you want to make sure you're using a, a treatment that is appropriate for the temperature and the time length that you have. So if you look at this slide, you can see that some of these treatments have very long periods where they're, they're being treated. You don't have many days left in the season. And so that's why when with Anna saying that Formic Pro or Mitoway Quick Strips is a good option, if you get a temperature window where you can get that in and we're still in that window, that is the quickest treatment that you can get in that is very effective on controlling mites. So, um, so yeah, make sure that you're picking the appropriate treatment for this time of the season and for the weather. Your weather app on your phone as a beekeeper is one of your best friends. Use that forecast so that you can determine what treatments you should be using right now. And one of the things I'd just like to add to that is, you know, we're kind of treating for two different reasons. During the summer, and during you know the whole season, we're keeping our own mites really low. This time of year is when we do start to get invasions from other colonies that are collapsing around us that have been overwhelmed by mites. Um, so it is really important to to you know not just pat yourself on the back. Um, if you've done a good job all summer, to make sure that you're continue to stay on top of it. Um, there are a couple more questions on Varroa. So um, Anna, someone asks if they can test for Varroa in October or if they should keep the colony um, closed up. Yeah, that's a good question. So one part of it depends on weather. So we're probably going to have some days that are really nice and bees are flying. And in those occasions, you could do a mite test. And then there's going to be some occasions where they're colder and bees aren't flying and maybe even clustered and that's when you wouldn't want to dig into them. Um, you would want to be extra super careful that you don't accidentally have your queen in your sample at this point of year, because that would be unfortunate. Uh, but you can do a mite test if you need to, but ideally you've already been doing mite tests and you already have a test count from September that you can work off to make your late season decisions. Excellent. And then Dan, there's a question, when is a good time to do the oxalic acid treatment? Yeah, so again, it varies a little depending on your situation, but when we think about oxalic acid, it's, it's not something that's going to kill mites underneath the capping. So 
I look for typically the first opportunity when the bees are broodless. Um, it's going to be a little high to high variability, but I generally find that to be around Halloween, roughly you know, towards the end of October. Um, that, that's when I'm looking at it again in, in mid Michigan. Um, but you're, yeah, you're, you're looking for that broodless period. And I kind of figured the sooner the better, and I'm going to be into a little warmer temperature range there. Um, I prefer the dribble over the sublimation. So that's what I look to do at the end of October, start of November. Excellent. And um, so I'm just going to do a couple more of the Varroa ones. And then um, we only got through about half the questions that we have, but thankfully we do have another webinar scheduled. Um, and so you can register for that. If we um, didn't get to your question in the Q&A, please do submit it um, through the form so that we can make sure to answer it in the next time. Um, and I'm going to give this one to you again because you're the monitoring queen. At this point, most of my hives have less than 1% mites, but one has 3%. Should I treat them all or just the 3%? He's been treating with Formic Pro. Yeah, that's a great question. And first of all, I just want to say that's awesome that you're monitoring for mites. Um, typically, the recommendation is that you treat the whole yard if you have one colony that's high. Uh, this time of year bees are robbing and so that's definitely an opportunity where healthy colonies that maybe have low mite levels can bring mites back with them so uh, to be on the safe side i would treat the whole yard i agree um and then i'm just looking to see if we have more there's one question that i think is kind of relative to the mites and then everything um, so Sherry and Bob said the second, they're second year beekeepers. The first year we lost our bees to mites. Sorry about that, but you're not alone. Um, this year we did the mite away quick strips and just finished the second week of treatment. We're managing eight frame mediums, um, two boxes, top boxes are full of honey and we plan to, to do the top feeder. Both hives seem quite strong going into winter. The one is a split from July. What are we missing to ensure success over winter? Does anyone want to take that? How about Adam? Yeah, I can definitely take that. So it sounds like you're, you're pretty good on your way. If you've got mites under control, um, it sounds like uh, that you have uh, two boxes. So we're managing eight frame, two boxes, top boxes are full of honey and we plan to do so I guess my question would be is when we're saying that we're managing eight frame mediums with two boxes, it sounds like there's a couple honey supers on top of those. If you're, so if you're saying that you have four boxes, eight frame boxes that are full of honey, um, that, would be, that would be plenty right there. That'd be the situation that I normally overwinter in is eight frame mediums, four deep um, of those. Um, you have uh, two hives that seem quite strong um, going through, it, you know, being one is a split that really doesn't matter as long as it's got enough resources on. I would say if you've got your honey stores on and you've been doing mite treatments that you're in good shape um, going into the winter and the big things to keep in mind moving forward. And I think this is an important point that Megan med made early on in this talk is that if we do get a warm October, they will start motoring you know, through resources. Um, and you may want to kind of supplementally feed um, during those periods where they're active, but there's just nothing available in the landscape. So that would be one thing that I'd say, keep your mind on um, as you're moving into winter. Um, and then the last thing I would say is that if you do have the option, if you've been doing my away quick strips, you know, that cleanup uh, treatment with oxalic acid is always a nice thing to do after you go broodless, just to make sure you're knocking down any of those phoretic mites that are still hanging around. Excellent. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, everyone, for your attention and for listening and to all your fabulous questions. It's awesome for us to hear that people are taking time out of their evenings to learn about your bees. The best thing that you can do is put the time into learning about them. Um, so we do really appreciate your attention and your support. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.